This video is about the important skill of using confidence intervals. We must be comfortable interpreting them. Imagine we are providing a 95% confidence interval for the impurity level in our sulfuric acid product produced over the last year. We could provide this, for example, to a prospective customer as a statement of the quality of our product. If the interval has a lower bound of 429 parts per million and the upper bound is 673 parts per million, this is a compact representation of our process's capability. It summarizes several things. Firstly, we can average the two values and get a number of 551 ppm. That number would have been the sample mean of the raw data. We can see the equations of the bounds are symmetrical, so x bar would be in the center. This is the samples mean, not the population mean. Secondly, if we had some additional knowledge of the number of samples used, we could back calculate what the standard deviation was. Ideally, confidence intervals should be reported with the number of samples used. Knowing the standard deviation then gives us great insight into the quality of the process used to make the product. High standard deviation indicates poor quality, poor lack of control of the upstream process. Low standard deviations indicate good reproducibility with low variability. Implicit in the confidence interval would be the requirement also that the samples were normally distributed. Confidence intervals are not commonly used in practice between companies and clients, but we will see in the next videos they have a powerful interpretation, especially in the context of judging if we've made improvements to our process. As mentioned before, never trust your gut feeling or only by looking at plots. Confidence intervals quantify the results for us so we can make accurate judgments. We will also use them extensively in the topic on linear regression in the next section, as well as designed experiments. I would like to return back to the prior example where we had these nine values. The mean was 20 and we calculated the confidence interval with a lower bound of 17.1 and an upper bound of 22.9 when using the sample standard deviation. I want to explain what the confidence interval does not imply. It does not imply that x bar, the sample average, lies in the interval from 17.1 to 22.9. It is true that x bar will always lie within this bound. That was how the bounds were calculated. The confidence interval is not about x bar, it is about the parameter mu in this case. It is also not correct to say that the sample average of 20 units lies in the range of 17.1 to 22.9 with a probability of 95%. Again, the sample average always lies within the range, and the confidence interval is not about the probabilities of finding something inside a range. Rather, let us look at how the confidence interval should be used. It implies the population parameter mu lies within that interval with a given level of confidence. The confidence interval is a range of values for the parameter. As you look at the equation for the lower and upper bound, you notice that it depends on the values calculated from our data sample. X bar and S are calculated from the N sample values. The critical value of T is also selected by the user. What that implies is that if we were to take a different sample of data from the same process, we will get a different X bar and S, and perhaps even a different number of samples N. That indicates we will get a different lower and upper bound still from the same process. If we repeat that sampling yet again, we will get a different set of bounds each time. So how should we interpret the confidence intervals? The correct interpretation is that it is the probability that the range contains the true parameter. 95% of the time, the range will contain the true mean. 5% of the time, the true parameter will be outside our calculated range. 95% probabilities imply that we are wrong 5 times out of 100, or 1 time out of 20. So we are right 19 times out of 20. You might even have heard that expression in the media and the news regarding opinion polls. Now you know where it originates from. Here is a subtle distinction, which is a peculiarity of the English language, but it is important to get right. The confidence interval is not the probability that the true parameter lies within the range. Rather, it is the probability that the range contains the true parameter. 
The reason why it is not the first case is because the parameter has no probability associated with it. It is 100% fixed, we just don't know what its value is. Let's also look finally how the confidence interval changes as we change some of the terms associated with it. Start by considering n. As we use more samples from a given process, the confidence interval range becomes narrower. That should make sense. As one uses more samples, the greater our ability to estimate a process parameter more accurately. That narrower confidence interval range implies you have better bounds for the true but unknown mean. There are diminishing returns though, because there's a square root. What we also learn from this is that narrow confidence bounds are more desirable than wider confidence bounds. A wide bound is much less useful and associated with greater uncertainty. So what happens if the standard deviation changes? We can practically decrease the standard deviation by using a better control system or buying equipment that operates more accurately. If the standard deviation decreases, we see here that the interval decreases as well, indicating a higher process quality because of lower variability. The last parameter we could adjust is our confidence level. We typically choose 95% levels, but what if we wanted higher values, such as being 99% confident the range contains the true parameter? As we go to higher levels of confidence, our critical values for t increase. As we read from left to right within a row of the table, the area in the tail becomes smaller, since the probabilities are increasing. We see then that the corresponding value for z becomes larger. I've shown you for our example what happens to the bounds when the confidence level changes. Requiring higher level of confidence leads to wider bounds. Remember you get to choose the level of confidence, but your bound will be wider. You can be 100% confident, but that won't get you a very useful bound. So in summary for this section, we can calculate two types of confidence intervals so far. Confidence intervals where we know the standard deviation and those where we don't know the standard deviation. In the first case, here on the left, we know that our x bar is normally distributed with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared over n. In the second case, on the right, where we use the estimated standard deviation, our z value is t distributed with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Both cases require us to assume that the data are independently sampled. The equations for the bounds are also summarized here, indicating how the critical values, either from the normal or t distribution, are found using computer software.